finding uh, the source of love which is inside um, and that every that all the feelings of love whether you know like if you're if you're with somebody and you feel like you're completely accepted by that person that you only ever have that feeling inside you so it's there already it's just a matter of being able to access it so if you can access that when there's nobody around and you can feel completely accepted then what somebody the actions that somebody external to you takes it's not going to affect that because you've already accessed it yourself you know like i don't need that other person to make me feel accepted it's, mm -hmm. I, I can access it already you know beautiful welcome to hooked on art podcast uh, your podcast about art emotion and life my guest today is Irish artist John Dalton. He is an accomplished writer, podcaster, and craniosacral therapist. He is the host of two podcasts, Further Emergence and John Dalton Gently Does It. Further Emergence focuses on topics of spirituality and emotion, while John Dalton Gently Does It is dedicated to interviews with contemporary figurative artists. Uh, John has an extensive experience working in the field of craniosacral therapy and he wrote several books The Gentle Snap, Maya Noise, Why Do We Get Sick, Why Do We Get Better and But Then Again. John is a very kind person who shares his views on art and life in this interview. Please welcome John Dalton. <laughs> Let's start! Okay, let's start. Oh, let's start. All right, welcome to my show, John. Thank you. You're very, very happy to be here. <laughs> so let's start uh, with your art podcast. And I, I'm actually th uh, thinking of starting with the questions that you got. And there are just a few. The, the, the first question is from Aixa. Aixa. Well, her question is, what inspired you to create the art podcast? So we can start there. Right. Um, well, I had just finished, or I, I'd, I'd written a book called Maya Noise. I um, had a, my own website, uh, which is johndalton.me. And it's a WordPress site, or I used WordPress on it. And that always asks you for a subtitle, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I made that, I, th I thought gently does it would be kind of funny and nice. And, you know, there's a couple of different meanings to it. So that was already existing, you know, John Dalton done me. And then it's just, gent you know, gently does it. Because then it's like, oh, yeah, John Dalton gently does it. Oh, yeah, that's nice. And um I had had a podcast, that, um, the art podcast was actually my second podcast because the first one I had in 2007-ish and it was to accompany a book I'd written at that time called Why Do We Get Sick? Why Do We Get Better? And um, back then, that's when podcasting was really getting going. So I did that podcast for a while and it was fine and then podcasting sort of died off and I just kind of let that podcast die off with it. Um, and then when I wrote May Noise, um, I thought, yeah, there's a few things I would like to kind of add to that, to what I'd written or, or expand on it a little bit. So uh, I thought I'll do a little podcast for that. And the podcast just naturally became what, because it was hosted through the website, you know, John Dalton gently does it. So that's how the name happened. And the first 12 episodes I, I videoed, um, and they're just pretty much me talking about the sort of things I talked about in Maya Noise. And um, then I I sort of said everything I wanted to say and I didn't do any more with it for about six months. And what, during that time I was in the studio painting and listening to podcasts and listening to conversations and thinking, oh, that'd be nice. That'd be nice to have conversations with people. I think I could do that. And initially I thought, well, what, what, who would I talk to? And I thought, well, I'll talk to people that in the three areas that I'm kind of interested in, which is like natural health, spirituality and art. And from that moment on, it kind of took on a life of its own, meaning the spirituality people and the natural health people, it was always really difficult to organize logistics, technicals, problems, it just was hard. But the art people, it was easy, super easy. 
So the very early episodes you'll find, they're not all artists, you know, I talk to comedians, I talk to activists, I talk to all sorts of different people. But very quickly, it just starts to focus more and more and more on art. And it kind of took on a life of its own and just became this, you know, what it is now, which is art, uh, artists, but then also figurative artists. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very specific now, but uh, it didn't start off like that. Why do you think it, it moved from general to more specific? I don't know. I don't know, because I really wanted to try and have the three, you know, I, wanted, I didn't want it to be that specific, you know, and in a way the pod, the other podcast I have now, the Further Emergence podcast, that is kind of, the, you could say that's the spiritual side of it, but it's mm -hmm. just, you know, came around in its own separate kind of podcast. I mean, I suppose in thinking about the way people are like, um, I, maybe I was trying, it was like it was too, it would have been too broad anyway, because like to have somebody who's interested in those three things, I don't know, it, it seems like it's easier to just be specific about, you know, this podcast for art, that one's for spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just as I say, it wasn't any conscious thing on my part, it just, and there's a few different aspects of it that are like that, you know, I used to plan in advance who I was going to talk to, and that never worked out. I used to have a big long list of people who I'd, you know, yes, I'm going to work my way through this list. Never worked out. Uh, so now I don't plan like that at all. It's very, very spontaneous, you know. Why do you think it didn't work? Because people didn't respond to your invites or? Uh, well, I think it's because it, it's, um, there's something about the immediacy of, of it. Uh, because I, I I know I know if I get in touch with somebody and say, can you come on the podcast in six months time? Oh, yeah. By the time we get there, mm -hmm. maybe I don't like their art anymore. Maybe um, they're not available. Maybe they're painting in a different way. You know, it's mm -hmm. all too far in the future. Whereas when it's um, it's usually like a week or two in advance, I don't really mm -hmm. let it go more than that. And I don't really plan. I, I sort of as I'm going through Instagram, I'll be I just have a little kind of I'll save somebody, you know, that I think if, as I come across them, I'll save their, you know, the way you can mm -hmm. save people into. Mm -hmm. And then um, when it's time to um, to um, get in touch with somebody to come on the podcast, I'll just look at that and kind of which and it isn't even the, the top of the list. It's just whichever one, mm -hmm. you know, and then I generally I'll I'll send out two or three different invitations and that usually keeps me going for a while. How many artists did you interview so far? Uh, well, let's see. I'm on episode 280 and the first 12 are me talking. And then you could probably discount another 10 for people who are not artists. So I'm at 260 artists. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. So what do you find interesting in artists that you may not see in other people? Um, well, I find everybody interesting, actually. So <laughs> just, a okay. matter of, you know, uh, it's more just that I talk to artists because it's an art podcast now, you know, mm -hmm. but I've had other people on the Further Emergence podcast, for example, or the earlier people that I talked to um, in the beginning. You know, it doesn't really matter who they are. Like everybody's interesting. Everyone's got a story. If you uh, mm -hmm. can be qu quiet and listen and ask them the right questions, then mm -hmm. it'll come out, you know. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> what did you, what did you learn from artists? The artists I interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of different things. That sort of feels like I, I, I sort of feel like the podcast has been like um, going to art school in a way, not technically, even though I did learn a lot of stuff technically as well, not directly, but they just mentioned something or a way of doing something. And then I'd go up and I'd go off and research it and learn technically. But I think the um, talking to all the artists and doing the podcast really nurtured me as an artist. 
um, which you, which is like separate from being a painter. Like I did learn a lot of painter tricks, but I think um, doing the podcast and talking to so many artists really nurtured me as an artist. Mm. Did you have a formal training? No. No. So you just started painting on your own? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I stumbled into a bark drawing class. <laughs> Didn't oh. even know what it was, you know, mm -hmm. um, because like my um, when when I was growing up in my family, my sister was much better at art, at drawing than I was. And in the way things go in families, she was kind of considered the artist. And because my drawings were not that good, I wasn't. So when I left school, even though I did art in school and even though I did get an honor in art, but I did it with ceramics. You know, I, I, I was sort of better with my hands rather than uh, drawing, you know. And um, I went into being a carpenter. You know, that's what I that's that's the, the track I yeah. was on kind of thing. And, um, you know, even then, uh, like, it seems like like a theme in my artistic life was being around people who are way better than I was <laughs> because I worked in uh, I was very I was quite good at photography and based on my photography portfolio, I got mm -hmm. um, I got I started to work in an animation studio in camera um, and then I went on to become very highly trained in animation camera work, all of which is was was taken over by computers now but you know I could do all sorts of optical effects and all sorts of things but being around um I was surrounded by artists professional artists who just were fantastic at drawing you know mm -hmm. and I could remember you know we had a life drawing class in, in the studio one time and um I joined in you know but it was demoralizing because they were so much better than I was you know so I um I kind of didn't I didn't really think about it too much. I did lots of other creative things, but I didn't, I, I just said kind of, I suppose, just ag agreed that I wasn't that good. And then um, it wasn't until 2013, around the time I started this podcast, uh, my podcast, um, I just kind of got tired of thinking like that and went, you know what, I think I would just... I want to learn how to do it. I want to learn how to draw. And I just did a bit of, you know, Google searching, found a school in Dublin and went along to it. Now, at the time, I didn't I didn't know anything, but I inadvertently walked into a Bach drawing class and they were teaching in a very classical way. And it was great. It just suited me down to the ground. And that sort of started me. And then um, I can remember the first time I saw somebody somebody's work, Francis O'Connor, an Irish artist, and I didn't even see it in person. I just saw it online and I can remember feeling physically ill. It was so good. And and that thing of, you know, that nearly everybody has of like, I didn't realize people could still paint like this, that, that human mm -hmm. beings were still doing this. I thought it was, you know, gone with Rembrandt and all the others, you know, kind of thing. And um, just the I think that just kind of propelled me on of like, I wonder, I wonder, can I can I draw? You know, yes, I can. You know, and I practice and did all the things that you do, and 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 satisfied that question. Then it was like, I wonder, can I paint? Started off in acrylics, and you know, satisfied that yes, I can paint. And then you know, oil paint the same. And um, yeah, pretty much. I I wouldn't say I taught myself, but I you know because nobody teaches themselves. You know, it was YouTube. I did courses. Um, got DVDs, all the usual kind of things, and just practiced a lot. Mm -hmm. So was that school in Dublin or? Yes. Yeah. Dublin? Okay. I don't even know if it's still going, you know, it might, oh. it might, have, just, it might have just appeared just for me and then disappeared when I stopped going. <laughs> so did you work in animation for a long time? I did, yeah, about, um, I think it was like 10 years, 10, 15 years, something like that. Oh, wow. I, in, I pretty in, much in did Dublin? everything. In yeah, Dublin. in Dublin. Uh, all on sort of the I started in one studio where um it was you know it was so lucky really there was no there was no animation in Ireland at all and then Sullivan Bluth started they were a big big you know movie studio a massive like 350 people kind of operation 
all American um, because the Irish government were giving out a lot of grants for that. And then the one I was in was a smaller one. It was called Emerald City Productions, and they were doing um, TV movies of Charles Dickens classics. That's what I started on. And nobody in the studio had ever worked in animation before. So it was run by um, husband and wife team, uh, Canadians, and they were training everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right across the board. So it was great. Like we were all starting off together and we were all learning and it was it was quite quite amazing, really, when I think back on it, you know. Was it a creative Maybe. environment? No, animation is not really no. a creative environment because you have, um, you know, like say with Sullivan Blues, you've got 350 artists all funneling their creative energies in behind one person's vision, you know, the director. Oh. Um, and, you know, there are like the animators, there's a certain amount of room for creative expression because most animators are kind of closet actors and they're kind of expressing their desire to act through the characters that they're drawing. Mm. So there's a certain amount of creative expression there, but within limits and um, background artists, it's the same thing. You know, they've got to paint to a particular thing. They can express themselves. Like there was one background artist in the studio I worked in and he, um, he had a very dark kind of personality. So he was always getting rats into his backgrounds. You know, you could, I could tell when it would come into camera, yeah, this is one of Jerry's, you know, because it'll have a little rat somewhere in it, you know. So there was a bit, a bit of an expression there, but um, not much. So, um, yeah, I went from that to a few other studios um, that kind of developed. Um, probably the most well-known thing I worked on was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the TV series. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot of the camera work on that, but um, I did a lots of different things. I was in an animation startup, so I did a lot of writing, a lot of, um, you know, kind of producing. I did everything in animation except draw or paint, <laughs> okay. which was great. But, you know, it just kind of perpetuated that thing of, of not thinking I was that good at it, you know. So you said you did writing and some camera work. What does it mean exactly? Like, what is it about the camera work? I mean, I don't know anything about animation. Well, back then it was all on film. So um, you, the um, the camera department was like the end of the production line. Uh, you know, it would kind of start with storyboard, then it would go into layout. Um, so each, you know, storyboard break down each shot in a in a movie. Uh, then layout would design the environment, if you like, that the characters moved around in. And um, then that would kind of split and the, the layouts would go to the background department, so they would be painted. So it was like if there was an interior scene, that would have, would have to be painted. Um, so it would be painted empty, no characters mm-hmm. in it. Um, then the, um, the, the animators then would animate the action in the particular shot. Um, uh, then it would go to Xerox, then it would go to um, all the drawings, you know, so in a in a uh, sort of 10 second shot, you might have two or 300 drawings. Each one of those would be photocopied onto acetate, so clear see through. Mm-hmm. And then with the outline of the drawing, then those dra- those cells would go to paint and they'd be painted. Um, so by the time it came to me, I'd have this big folder of stuff and then uh, it's called a dope sheet it was like the what what went where for each frame and then i would you know line it all up on the on the uh rostrum rostrum cameras or animation cameras they're big huge things like a big altar <laughs> you know it's a big table and then the camera is above it looking down on it and then i'd assemble each um each frame and shoot it one frame at a time wow wow yeah. so meticulous wow yeah yeah you you must have a lot of patience. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's it's very it was a very weird kind of job, you know, because you'd go in, you were kind of working in a dark room the whole time, you know, because the light has to be constant. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're you're working in a light proof room with lights, of course, it's not fully dark. But then if you were doing any kind of special effects, you know, like say if there was a fire in a scene. You'd shoot the whole scene and then you'd have to rewind everything and then all the lights go out and you're sort of 
the lights are, you know, and you'd have the effects animator would have made these kind of transparent uh, animated flames. So you'd have to light them from underneath and re double expose the, the film, if you know what I mean, to put the mm -hmm. to put the flames in, you know, so depending on how complicated the scene was in terms of special effects, you might run the film through the camera many, many times. You know, I, mean, I can remember us doing a, a commercial for Christmas one time. And I think we ran the film through like 36 times. It was 36 different elements that had to be exposed on the film. And uh, I think that was like for, uh, I think it was 30 seconds or less, the actual, you know, it was like this jeweled box that turned around. And, but uh, yeah, like that was a huge amount of work. And if you screwed up at all, it was ruined. You couldn't oh. screw up one frame. Oh, wow. Yeah. Why did you quit then? Um, let's see. I, well, I was kind of went from one studio to another. Um, and I was, um, I did a, I did a film and TV production course uh, in the middle of all that. And then I did, um, then I was, I went to America for a while and then I was kind of poached back when I was, as I was coming back from America, I was asked to go, would I work in the Murakami one, you know? So it was kind of, um, it, uh, but when that one finished, then what did I, I'm trying to remember now. Oh yeah. I went into the startup. That's right. They went into the startup one and then the startup one um, went for about a year and a half and then it it um, failed, basically, <laughs> owing everybody lots of money. And um, and then I went into I had an exhibition of my photography that I was touring around and then I went into being a craniosacral therapist. So I just changed careers, you could say. I, I had yes. to Google that. Uh, I had to Google the term to understand what what the hell that was. <laughs> yeah. So uh, June Stratton is asking several questions, and I think you partially answered some of them, but I'm gonna read them anyways. Um, what are the most common struggles that artists have? What is the most unusual? artist ritual you have heard of and does the time you spend on your podcast get in the way of your own artistic expression or do these conversations inspire you thank you john thanks june june was on the podcast she's great please take a second of your time to rate the podcast if you feel so inclined thank you very much um I'd say imposter syndrome. That's the imposter. main. <laughs> yeah, it's the most common one. You know, it doesn't matter how successful, how you know, they all have it. Um, I've stopped talking about it in terms of imposter syndrome, and now I just ask them, how do they deal with self doubt? I just assume, you know. And it's so funny. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you can listen to the person, and they're very confident, and you know, be because it's always in after all the technical questions. And they're explaining about things and they just, you know, they're just oozing confidence. And then I'll go, and so how do you deal with self-doubt? And then they go, oh, well, you know, self-doubt is so difficult. I've had such struggles with it. And you'd never know, you know, unless you ask them. But um, yeah, that's, that's, say that's the most common one is um, self-doubt. And then it it kind of goes in sections then. A lot of artists deal with, um, how to make it work financially mm -hmm. and how to not compromise. And that can take different shapes. Some artists are, their struggle is how do I remain authentic? Um, because my success has become a bit of a millstone now because I, I'm, there's pressure to, to keep doing what I'm already doing. So I, how do I, how do I stay creative? How do I just do what, what I want to do and go in different directions. That can be a problem for other artists. It's it's um, how do I just, you know, make enough money to keep going. That, that can be that can be a thing as well. Um, nearly all artists you know, have find some way of 
sustaining their energy with it doesn't matter how much they love it and they can dip like everybody so yeah i think those are the main ones mm -hmm. do you experience self-doubt yourself as an artist or just generally um both um i I don't really think of it as self-doubt. I'm very conscious of what goes on inside me. I meditate a lot, so I'm very used to hearing my inner monologue and I'm very familiar with the different kind of voices inside me. So, um, yeah, I suppose it's self-doubt, but it, it doesn't sort of eat me alive the way mm -hmm. it would have in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm kind of in dialogue with those parts of me now. Mm -hmm. So I, I certainly, they're there and you know as you become more conscious different things come to the surface and it's like a process of layers going down different you know you one layer comes up and you work through it and then another layer and it's just it's an ongoing process so i'm i'm very familiar with that process which i probably would have called self-doubt like a, an umbrella kind of term for it but it's um i'm not in conflict the way i used to be uh, mm -hmm. with it and that's both, that covers everything, both artistically and, and just generally, you know. Because it loses its importance at some point when you're aware of your thoughts. Well, I kind of think of them like depending on what it is, uh, but generally it always feels to me like a small child part of me, like a that's been, that hasn't, hasn't kept up with the rest of me so it's almost like i'm i sort of feel like my role is like parental i'm kind of reparenting mm -hmm. that part of me that didn't get the parenting it needed mm -hmm. so i'm very uh, and i also i kind of know that they'll they take me over if i don't do that you know like mm -hmm. they'll i'll find myself doing things that i particularly want to do or are, are not very um good for me like we were talking mm -hmm. about drinking earlier i mean i don't drink anymore but that, that's a good example you know and um, the, the impetus to oh, just let's go and have a drink you know and it's like now i would kind of get into a conversation with the part of me that wanted to do that and go yeah we can do that but why do you want to do that kind of thing what what's the pain we're trying to get away from i get into that mm -hmm. you know so it, it's this process of reparenting that's what it feels like anyway mm -hmm. or replacing the negative is the positive yeah i never found that worked in fact i found it it made it worse particularly like you know affirmations are very popular but often mm -hmm. uh, i found affirmations just the shadow of an affirmation like let's say i'm overweight and i, I you know and my affirmation is i am thin you know, like when I listened to the conversation inside mm -hmm. me, it would be like if I was going, I am thin, there'd be an echo of like, no, you're not, you're fat. Like, no, 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 I'm thin, you know, no, no who are you kidding? You, you know, it would just, I would actually get stronger, you know, mm -hmm. whereas uh, I found that that didn't work for me, like um, that, that uh, I couldn't just replace it. I had to kind of get it. What, what, what a surprise. I, I finally found a person who who doesn't believe in affirmations <laughs> because I'm well, for some people for some people they work but for me they didn't it just made it worse I I think it comes up uh, it comes down to your own belief system like if you are easier to believe to something so it's easy for you to imagine that affirmation and make it reality but if you don't believe in that affirmation it's very difficult to make it work that's what i find in this yeah well I, as i say i can only really speak from my own experience but you know and I, I do work with a lot of people as well and it's 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 common enough that if you just um think you know you can stare in the mirror and tell yourself you are something that you're not what you're kind of doing is denying your experience like you're mm -hmm. denying what's going on inside you and you're you're the the part of you then that, that's on the inside going no i'm a terrible person or no i'm terrible with money or no i'm overweight or whatever it is the thing you're trying to change 
if you just keep kind of trying to drown it out with affirmations, it gets stronger, much stronger. And mm -hmm. because you're kind of being disrespectful to it and you're ignoring it and you're, you're saying, I'm not listening to you, you're not real, you know, and it's of course it is, I'm very real and it's in pain. Whereas, as I say, I found it much better for me is to kind of go, uh, come out of the dark, tell me all about it, tell me, you know, you know, and and ad adopt this kind of perspective of of being the the parent and filling the gaps in the parenting for that part of me and helping it to heal, and then it goes away for good and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. come back. Yeah, I I agree yeah. with you on that. Yeah, that's that's my experience because affirmations just didn't cut it. <laughs> um go, going back to her questions what is the most unusual artist ritual you have heard of um i think martin campos springs to mind he um he would arrange five or six canvases in a circle around himself all primed all ready to go and he wouldn't have a He'd have a paintbrush and paints in the center with him. This is if I'm remembering it right. I think it's pretty close. And rather than um, have an idea of what he's going to paint, he just stays there very still and waits. And then he just kind of has this explosion of activity and he'll start painting all six at the same time wow. in, a, in a kind of frenzy. Um, and once that phase is over, then he'll kind of look at what he's done and go and start to see if it's not already obvious to him. And sometimes it is. They're very clear. You know, that's a figure. This is another figure or whatever. He will uh, refine it then and start to get very detailed with it, you know, but that's pretty. Um, that's pretty out there. I haven't heard anyone else do that. Um, but um. Other than that, I think everyone's pretty the same, you know, like it's just small variations on. I mean, you know, it's you've got a substrate, you've got paint, you've got to get the paint from <laughs> from somewhere to onto the substrate. And and here we know. go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So does the time you spend on your podcast get in the way of your own artistic expression? Or do these conversations inspire you? Um, well, I struggled with that for a long time because I, um, I was confusing or com conflating being an artist with being a painter, because from the point of view of being a painter, it's definitely got in the way because, mm -hmm. you know, painting is just practice. So the more time you spend painting, the better you become. Um, and you know, the podcast is very labor intensive, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. So it took away from that. So I'm definitely not as good a painter as I would have been if I didn't do the podcast. But that's what I meant about it. It nurturing me as an artist, because um, at some point, a couple of years ago, I was talking to Anne McGill, uh, who's one of the artists that was on the podcast. And I was kind of talking about that of like, I'm always, you know, uh, torn between painting and podcasting and what should I do and she she was saying and she was right um that the podcast is part of my artistic expression mm -hmm. she was like you know it's part of and I suppose she was coming at it from a, a much more of a contemporary art kind of perspective where people do performance art, they do video art, they do all sorts of things like that. Whereas I was just kind of thinking of it in terms of like figurative, you know, atelier kind of training, all this kind of thing, you know. And um, yeah, I kind of realized I was the the golden goose kind of thing, you know, that idea. And it didn't matter what I did, they're all golden eggs, you know, that's kind of that, that kind of thing. And that just really soothed something in me. And I could kind of see it, you know, because she was kind of saying, you know, you, you know, you're building a you, like community building is part of what you do. Podcasting, communication, all these different things are part of it. And um, that really helped me. So it doesn't really, so it sort of switched from feeling like, oh, it's taken away from me being a painter to feeling of like, no, this is just part of my artistic expression. The podcast is as well, you know, and then that that way of thinking made me 
You know, I've I talked to so many artists and they generally will say something like they're very happy to get up in the morning, paint all day. They would paint all night if they didn't have, you know, other commitments and they'd be just completely happy to do that. And I never really felt like that with painting. I love painting, but I don't think I, you know, I knew I wasn't happy to do it all day long. But um, the further emergent stuff, I was. I was just realized, oh, yeah, I can do that stuff all day long. And I and that's pretty much what I do now. And I'm very happy to do it. I I love doing that sort of stuff. And talking to all those artists made me see that, you know, and see, mm -hmm. yeah, I love painting, but I don't love it as much as I love this other thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So all that really helped me, you know. It, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think as artists, we need to nurture ourselves. And it looks like your podcast has that quality of nurturing your ideas and emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving on to next question from, uh, it's a question from Takinada. Hello, John. Thank you very much for your podcast that plays a significant role in my working routine. As an artist, do you find it hard to not compare yourself to all that other gifted people that you talk to? Or if you do compare your artworks to other artists' works, does it benefit your work somehow or distract you? I used to. It's I a big to. question for artists overall. Yeah, 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 I used to. I used to compare myself. Um, and but I've come to realize that um, I've I th it's that Ira Glass thing about your eye and the gap between your eye and your ability, you know, that thing. I'm very I'm keenly aware of that. And my my taste or my eye is completely unaffected really by other people like and it's probably um why i can judge art competitions of no of no imposter syndrome about that because my eye is pretty ruthless like i i know what i like and i know what i don't like and uh, i'm, I'm and, and that applies to my own work as well so and i've had most artists are so encouraging you know and so i've had people sort of say oh your work is lovely and and I, that's lovely and all but to me i know exactly what is great about it and what's not great about it i've no uh, rose tinted glasses about my own work at all so i don't compare myself anymore i'm inspired by people you know and it's beautiful to come across somebody who's um work is just you know unbelievably good uh, i find it j just lovely you know but i i'm as equally as inspired by somebody who plays an instrument well or who does anything well who's mm -hmm. given their whole life to something you know and it just is their pure joy to to do that thing i'm as inspired by them as i am by by painters you know um and i also like technically i kind of know that I start, I haven't been doing it as long as other people as well. You know, like I, the people I talk to have, that, that, that's all they've done their whole life since they were like six years old or four years old. They've been drawing and painting, you know. So it would be cruel of me to compare myself to those people, you know, um, from a technical point of view. But from an artistry point of view and like being an artist, I, I don't think there really is a comparison because what comes out of me is going to be different to what comes out of somebody else. I don't think you can really compare that. I think it's a very valid question for a lot of artists. And, you know, sometimes I think about it, like when I see art painted so incredibly well. And, you know, I know <coughs> that I probably will never be able to, you know, paint that well. But, um, I kind of found the solution for that for myself, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to do my own thing. And so I know I cannot compete on a technical level or other levels, but as long as I stick to just being true to myself, 
you know, it, it, it helps like this type of thinking helps to <laughs> to negate yeah. the, you know, other <laughs> thoughts. Yeah, I think if you if you're happy with your painting, that's the main thing. Like for me, it's like if I'm if I get to the point where I'm like, OK, that's finished. I'm happy for that to I'm happy not to do any more to that. For me, that's kind of unassailable. Like if I'm happy, that's that, you know, then what other people where what happens after that is. Mm -hmm. you know, doesn't not, none of my none of my business, really, you know, but if, but if I'm not happy. And then I have to keep going until I am, you know. What I realized, I really enjoy the process itself. So it, it it's it's almost doesn't matter what comes out. I mean, I do want it to look the way I imagine it, <laughs> obviously. But most of the time, I kind of get disappointed in the end. But I feel so. I don't know. The, the process of painting is so fun and so interesting to me that it just keeps me going. Um, what yeah, about you? Um, is that the end result or the process or <laughs> the starting point? I think it's the process now. It used to be very end result oriented, um, but then I changed the way I painted a couple of years ago. And I have a feeling it's going to change again now, just based on a conversation I just had with uh, Devin uh, Cecil Wishing, where he was talking about photography. And, uh, you know, I find when I'm having these conversations with artists, you can kind of tell when something is pivotal. And that was a pivotal conversation. And the previous one was with um, Nicholas Uribe. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, yeah, I sort of went from painting i used to have a kind of very clear vision in my head of what i wanted to paint and then the process was getting that out of my head onto the canvas mm -hmm. and then um i went through a period of uh, not having any vision at all just having a a beginning like i'd have a photograph of something that had you know i'd been out and about and i'd seen something and i'd taken a photograph of it and then that would be my reference i wasn't trying to replicate what I the photo was I was mm -hmm. kind of investigating what it was it about it aesthetically that made me want to take a picture of it and painting kind of based on that and it would kind of evolve and go in different directions and um it was a it's a process of revealing itself you know mm -hmm. and that's been quite interesting and then just this conversation with Devin recently where he was saying um, that he doesn't use photographs at all um, because the original idea of painting was the artist was trying to capture what they were seeing and that if you take a photograph of it, it's like you're putting something in the way between that something get, is in between you and the the thing you're trying to paint and um something about that just clicked with me you know so i haven't I haven't i've not done anything about that but i kind of know that that's changed something now i probably will start he, he's a big still life uh, painter mm -hmm. um but oh, I, I understand why he says that yeah if he's a still life painter yeah but uh, i mean he he uh, like he's he, there's something about that so I'm, I'm not sure what that's going to be looked like for me but i can i know it's changed something in me what do you normally photograph what attracts you to photography nature usually nature yeah, yeah. you live I, in a beautiful I, spot thank you yeah i do yeah but even when I lived in cities, I, I generally would be photographing trees or something like that, or mist, or you know, urban. I, I and I find people very interesting, but I um, I can't get close enough to them, you know, with the camera. I, or meaning, when I get close to them, they start to change, and, and mm -hmm. the moment is lost. So I'd need a big telephoto lens or something, you know, and I need to be very far away from them to capture what I see, you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then of course you've got all sorts of privacy issues now as well so yeah, exactly na- yeah. na- nature nature is a lot easier for me yeah <laughs> yeah um i'd like to ask you about art contests because you judged several contests and yeah. um so when you judge art what do you see uh it- I, it's been quite a revelation actually for me being judging different things because I'm so conscious, you know, I've talked to so many artists, I know what it's like, I know the amount of hours that go into it, I know all the effort, um, and yet it it's very fast for me. Like I can go through, like I just finished judging the Almanara collection one, and I think there was... I don't know, three or four, 400, maybe 450 entries. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm able to know, like get it down from 400. I got it from 400 down to 20 in a couple of hours. Very easy. Wow, that was quick. (laughs) Yeah. Now the final 20, that was difficult because they were, you know, all fantastic. And the way that they, the, the way they wanted the judging was they wanted my you know like the final 10 and and they had to be in order like this is number one this is number two this is number three that was hard but the um getting it down to the i think i got it down to 50 pretty quickly um and it's just um i kind of know whether um it's kind of a combination of technical ability um and then there's a kind of an energy to a painting that works for me. Um, there's a kind of an electricity in it uh, where the person is kind of conveying something very authentic in a very, or it conveying something in a very authentic way uh, that captures something, not so much about the subject, but about the, per- the painter themselves or the artist themselves. And um, yeah, it's it's either there or it, or it isn't, you know. So something might be done very technically, technically might be brilliant, mm-hmm. but it's just kind of dead to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's you know within a couple of excuse me seconds or you know within ten seconds, twenty seconds, I can know whether I like it or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, and as I say, it's pretty ruthless. I can just you know I feel for the artist, but it's mm-hmm. like nope. <laughs> or yes, but that's or, or what I'll it, come back to you kind of thing. Yeah, you know? That's what it is. Uh, there cannot be other way. But help artists make strong impressions. Share what we can improve in our art submissions. Um, well, it's always amazing to me how, like, and I, I've kind of had to put myself in other people's shoes because I don't have this like I you know like I've submitted to art competitions and I've kind of known it's not really that good but Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in anyway kind of thing you know Uh, and when it didn't get selected I wasn't surprised you know whereas I get the feeling that you know other people don't have that they just think it's good Mm -hmm. um, and their eye is not that good and um I think if you know that about yourself, then it's you befriend somebody who has a good eye who can just tell you, no, it's not there yet, or it's not that good. They might be able to tell you why or what you need to do, but they can tell you if it's working or not, you know. So I think a long, hard look in the mirror is a good thing, you know, in terms of like, you know, pick your best work and show it to somebody who whose eye you respect. And if they tell you that it's good, then it probably is. But if they tell you it's not, then you know you can keep keep working at it until you you know you get it. But it's like recognizing that your eye is not there. <clears throat> that would be very helpful, mm-hmm. <laughs> and sort of fa- just accepting that and go, okay, I have to get somebody else to tell me if this is good or not. You know, you know, it, it's like um, I suppose it'd be good to ask yourself: Is this been done before? Has this been done before? Or what am I? doing here what am i saying here or what what, you know often uh, i see a lot of um work that is very like they've sort of seen somebody else do something and well that was very good i'm going to do my version of that 
generally doesn't work. You know, there's a sort of a deadness to that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, technically, there's a lot of, you know, like um, as there can be a lot of people whose ideas are good. You can kind of see what the painting could have been, but just technically it's not there, you know, and they don't know that it's not there yet, you know, mm -hmm. their technical ability. But do you think that, well, how many entries were bad technically as opposed to the good ones? Um, it's usually about 50-50. 50% are not there technically and the other 50% are there technically, but they're they're dead. You know, they're not the content, the idea, the, you know, it's beautifully executed, but it's it's got no life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but but the other thing about competitions is it's very subjective, you know. I mean, who mm -hmm. am I? Like, you know, that's just my eye, you know. It's just what I like, you know. And I think the competitions that are uh, judged by um, the bigger the panel, the better, because then you get lots of different people's inputs, you know. And you know, it's surprising. Like I've I've seen I've seen the finalists because I think there were ten judges on the Almanara one, and I think a lot of the ones that I picked from you know in my top ten, I think they've made it in. So there's a kind of consensus there but you know at least you're not just at the mercy of one person's mm -hmm. um perspective um or ones that are judged by a group you know like where people vote on them they're mm -hmm. good as well because then you, you have that a bit less but uh if you're happy with your work and you've checked <laughs> that it's technically okay you know with x get someone else to check it for you um then you know, I think it's that thing of like, don't take it personally and just keep going and reapply and, you know, apply to different competitions. And, you know, like I've talked to lots of artists who applied to the BP Portrait Award, for example, numerous years, you know, number of years. And um, sometimes some years they didn't get, even get anywhere. And then other years they won, you know. So mm -hmm. it's like, did you suddenly become a better artist? No, that's not the that's not the common thing. The common thing is that the ju the jury was different, you know. So mm -hmm. there's there's that, you know, that that um, often not getting involved, not getting in, or not getting um, featured in a competition is a lot more to do with the jury, you know. And I've heard that, you know, like because I've had quite a bit to do with the Bennett Prize, and I've talked to. Um, I've interviewed Stephen Bennett, who's who's, all, who's the constant member on the jury. The jury members change. There's always four jur jurors for that, and he said that as well. You know, different jury, different. You don't, you get a different prize. You know, you get a different chemistry between the jurors. You know, so yeah. it can be it can be a lot. A lot of it can be that. You know. Yeah, art is very subjective. Yeah. It is. Yeah, very it subjective. Is. Um. Do you think our contests should be free or not? Because it costs quite a lot of money, you know, to enter one contest. Sometimes it's like forty-five, seventy-five dollars for one painting, and it's like you you have to think for a week if you want to do it or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they should be free, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the ones that aren't free, I think it's a bit of a racket. You know, it's just a money making thing. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what I think. You know, it's a very nice business model, but and they <laughs> they all say it's for artists. But how come is it all for artists? I, I don't get it. Yeah. No, it's because just there's my so many people. Personal so many people. Yeah, because like usually, like when I did the John Dalton Art Prize, um, that was free to enter. Um, and I funded it through sponsors. Mm -hmm. Started off with one sponsor who put in a certain amount of prize money. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to use that to say, hey, these people are doing it. Why don't you sponsor it as well? And I ended up I think we had four sponsors and I got the prize pool up to 9,000 euro, $9,000, you know. Um, so it's possible, you know. 
to do that. Yeah, and but did you with... but did you find it hard to find the sponsors willing to uh, sponsor no. the contest? No, it wasn't. No, it? it was it was much easier than trying to get people to sponsor the podcast. Much easier because it's really easy for them to understand it. I think, um, like with uh, like the main sponsor was Kaleido, and then I was able to go to Rosemary's Brushes and say, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. This is what I'd like. Um, you know, give uh, free. All I had to do was give free um, brushes to the to the value of this amount, this much mm -hmm. for the, you know, the winners and this much for the um, honorable mentions. And they were like, yeah, that's great. No problem. Same with um, artifacts and same with Darticore. They all just was e really easy for them. You know, because it was mm -hmm. just all they had to do was give their products, you know, so they didn't have to give any money. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but the value of what they were all, can, you know, added up to that. And the artists were delighted because they were getting the products that they mm -hmm. would have liked to try out anyway. So everybody was happy, you know, it was really easy to do. Do, do you want to do it again? Or no. it was too difficult to, to deal with all? I... Yeah, I put, it was just yeah. way too much, too much, work. Uh, yeah. too much work because uh, I I should have or not should have, but I didn't know because I'd never done it before. But mm -hmm. you know, I can't. I, I didn't add up the hours because I didn't want to make myself depressed. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was so many hours. Yeah, uh, I understand involved, that. Yeah. Involved in that, um, because uh, while the sponsors were very happy to do their bit, they had their you know, businesses to get on with. So all the promotion, all the build up, everything I had to do, all of that, you know, the social mm -hmm. media, the the judging bit, that was easy enough. Um, but the everything around it was just huge, huge time mm -hmm. consuming. And um, so I didn't get paid for any of that. And, um, you know, I think to do it again, you'd have to you'd have to get paid for it. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not sustainable. But it was a good experience to do it, you know. I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again like that. I, I did my small art contest because um, uh, for my website, um, and I did it for several reasons, just to understand what it would be like, like what would be the difficulties if I wanted to make, be, because. Ideally, I want to make a prize for high school students in the future. I, 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 I cannot do it right now, but in the future. And so I um, made a small contest just to understand what moving parts would be mm -hmm. in there. And I found it very uh, time consuming, so, yeah. so time consuming that and and the second thing is marketing it, it just all comes down to marketing the you know the whole idea and all of that and it was just so frustrating i don't know yeah well i had the added complication of um because kaleido were uh, are an art are an art uh, platform uh, the people had to um upload their works onto kaleido and that just added a whole other layer of complexity. I was kind of like a, the IT department or, you know, like the people <laughs> ringing, you know, emailing me going, I tried to upload, it didn't upload. And then I'd have to, you know, you know, I had so much of that as well on top of all the marketing. I mean, the marketing was relatively easy because there was a good lead time. I was able to announce it on the podcast, give everyone plenty of time. And then on my uh, Instagram, but uh, yeah, the technical difficulties that people had, there was a lot of that, a lot of just answering emails and redirecting them to Kaleido if I couldn't handle the problem. And yeah. Well, John, I salute you because I understand <laughs> this very well. <laughs> you did yeah. a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to move on and ask you about uh, craniosacral therapy. Am I pronouncing it correct? Yeah. You're getting okay. them the right way around. A lot of people go sacrocranial. <laughs> so oh. you're, doing, you're doing good. <laughs> okay. So can you tell a story about the Australian man who had ringing in his ears and 
sensitivity to radiation in the context of uh, craniosacral therapy? What is it? So craniosacral therapy is predominantly, I certainly started off as hands-on, meaning, you know, it came out of osteopathy. Um, so it started off with, you know, your hands on the person. Um, and it came out of osteopathy, actually, and then it became, there was cranial osteopathy, and then from that, this craniosacral therapy. Um, and then the the more you do it, the more um, it sort of becomes like um, you're more attuned to the sort of energy system of the person. And then over time, you need to, you don't even need to be in with the person. And then now I work remotely. Now there's kind of uh, within craniosacral people who work remotely, they kind of don't like you to say that you're doing craniosacral therapy because they sort of feel like it's too out there. It's too strange to kind of say, oh, you can, you, you know, you actually you have to be in the same room as the person. You have to be actually touching them. And I understand that. That's that's fine. So I don't really like all I really talk about is like my my history and my experience. I started off as craniosacral therapist. <clears throat> I, you know, I taught people craniosacral therapy. I set up the Australian Institute of Craniosacral Therapy. Um, and then um, I always knew that I could work remotely. Everybody who does craniosacral knows it. Um, but uh, it just seemed like a really strange thing. Like it's hard enough to explain it when you are in the room with the person. But the idea of like, oh yeah, I don't have to actually be in the room with you. Uh, it just seemed like too much. But then the all the lockdowns happened and people just started getting in touch. And it just, I suppose, the consciousness changed and people were more open to it. So now exclusively, I just work remotely with people, you know. But in essence, your, you, your body has lots of different rhythms within it. You know, like you were all familiar with our heartbeat or our breathing or, you know, so there is a there is a particular movement in your body and uh, that r highlights very easily where there are restrictions or things are getting stuck. And if you you know, it's not easy to feel, but once you can feel it, then it's you can feel where uh, there's, you know, like some sort of traumatic imprint in the person's body and where it's trying to release. But maybe it's stuck and it can't release it. So uh, if you can feel that then you can sort of help it to do what it's already trying to do which is release this kind of trauma and then the person you know gets better or the pain stops or whatever and that that is in essence what i'm doing now but it's um probably at a deeper level um uh, with the one-to-one -one work that i do yeah but how does it work how can you see uh, the rhythm uh, you feel it with your hands. Uh, oh, okay. Well, if you feel it with your hands, how you can do it using Zoom? Okay. Well, it starts off with feeling it with your hands. Um, but then, like, you start off, yeah, you have your hands on the person and you can feel this particular movement, this craniosacral movement. The move, it's the production and reabsorption of cerebrospinal fluid. And you have to know anatomy really well, the, particularly the anatomy of the craniosacral system. You know, it's quite detailed. And But you're basically developing a palpatory skill, like a skill that you feel with your hands. You know, like palpatory just means, you know, like when you go to the doctor and say, I have a pain in my tummy, and he sort of pokes around in your tummy. <clears throat> that's palpation. That's what that's called. It's a version of that, except it's much more highly refined. So you can feel this movement with your hands, but you have, you know, to feel it better, you have your eyes closed. And then it, you have to have a very light touch because if you're very heavy handed, you'll crush it. You won't be able to feel it. You know, you'll sort of, you'll be mm -hmm. influencing the person's system. And, you know, initially, like when people are learning first, wherever they put their hands. So let's say I put my hand on my arm. All they can feel is just what's under their hand. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all they can feel. And then as they develop in their skill, because your system is you know, all connected, you know, the, the fascia is like this, this uh, packaging system, your body, you can feel everything in your body. 
uh, they can feel more and more. So they might be able to feel up as far as my elbow and down as far as my wrist just from one contact. And then eventually with more and more practice, they can put their hand on the person's, um, you know, the, anywhere on the person's body. So they might be, you might have your hand, they might have their hands on their ankles and they'd be able to know what's going on minutely in their head, you know, little tiny bones in their head and little structures wow. in their head, you know. And then, um, they, you know, they start to work with children and often, uh, you know, the, the mother might be holding the baby and you're kind of connected to the baby, but you can also feel what's going on in the mother as well um, through the baby and through the contact. And then it sort of develops where you might you might be working on a baby um, and maybe the baby is crying and you become really conscious that the father who's sitting in the corner is getting really distressed. OK, so you're not actually touching the father, but you can feel it and you can in the same way as you're sort of helping the baby system to release. You're also helping the father system to settle and be OK as well. And again, more and with more and more practice, you you know, you just can keep zooming out and zooming out. So eventually um, you don't have to be in contact with the person at all because you're kind of working behind the scenes, you know, that's certainly the way it feels to me. Um, but that's kind of getting more into the deeper. Uh, I, I was going to say uh, philosophical, but it's not really for philosophical. I suppose it's kind of a spiritual perspective, but it's like um, that's why the way it feels to me. Like I remember a woman, a woman, one woman saying to me, how do you find me? I was like, what do you mean? So well, of all the billions of people in the world, you know, I'm in a different country to you. How do you find me? And I said, well, I don't find you. You find me, you know, because it's almost like it, it, what it feels like is like um, existence is a bit like a virtual reality simulation kind of thing that we're in. And I sort of pull back from it. And when I do that, the person's just right beside me. So in the in existence, they're in another country. But when I pull back from it, they're right beside me. So we can just work. I can just work with them. And this, the story you're talking about is um, a man I, I was working with in Australia and I was seeing him for he had um, intense radiation uh, overexposure. So he was very sensitive to any kind of radiation. So if there was somebody in the car in front of him on the highway and they were on their phone, he could feel it in his body. Like he would he would feel nauseous. He, would, he was that bad. He used to have to wear a kind of uh, copper balaclava if he was going into certain stores that had a lot of Wi-Fi. Oh. He, he, and he had to live in the country. And if you went to visit him, you had to turn your mobile phone off before you came to see him kind of thing, you know. And uh, so he had he had that and then he had very bad tinnitus, which is like a ringing in the ears. And that's what he was. That's what he was coming to see me about. And that was all getting better. And as I say, I'm in Ireland. He's in Australia. And he was. Um, that was all getting better. And then one week he said to me, could you have a look at my eyes? And I said, yeah, sure. What what's going on with them? And he said, well, my left eye is a little bit drier than my right eye. And uh, I said, OK, well, tell me, have you had any trauma to your eye? And he said, well, I was falsely arrested about 25 years ago and I was beaten up in the police station. Uh, so maybe that might have affected. It. I said, OK, so um, we did the session. I did. There was quite a bit of trauma in his eye, which released. And um, the next week I was saying to him, you know, he was telling me how his radiation was and the tinnitus and all that. And I said, oh, how'd you get on with your eye? How's your eye been? He said, that's funny. That's a funny thing. You should say that because uh, the day after our session, I came down to breakfast and my wife said, what happened to you? And uh, he said, uh, uh, what do you mean? She said, go and look in the mirror. And he went and looked in the mirror and he had a black eye. And like that's very common in um, like in working with people, say w w actual in-person kind of work as traumas are releasing, people can, you know, the it's almost like the shadow of the incident or the accident will come out and they'll have that little symptom for a while. Uh, but that 
the fact that he had that happen at distance is um, it's just a nice illustration of how it works, really. Or that well, it does work. Were you surprised by this result, or or you kind of expected it to happen? Well, the sad thing about that is, um, while that's very dramatic and it makes for a good story, it kind of overshadows the fact that this man was debilitated severely by his radiation and his tinnitus and that they had all improved, but just it had improved slowly, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where he can go into shops now, he can be around people with cell phones, his tinnitus is almost gone. You know, that to me is much more impressive, but it doesn't make for such a good story. Mm. Because we usually don't see small changes, we kind of tend to focus on very big results. Yeah. I, I have more questions, I just need to know if you have the time or not. Yeah, no, I'm good, far away. Y you're good. <laughs> All right, I don't want you to start drinking or crying. <laughs> or both. <laughs> oh, yeah, or both, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on then. Um, you often write and talk about mystery and illusion of reality. And I'm curious to learn what it means to you. What does it mean, mystery, and what's the illusion of reality? That's what, well, my, what was it? my last book, yeah, The Gentle Snap. It's all about that. Um, it's all about uh, if you don't assume things, you begin to sort of see that uh, illusion is not as solid as it looks. And it's kind of similar to what I was saying in my explanation about, about the work I do, is that uh, it, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a simulation or it's a virtual reality thing, but it, I, it's very significant that everything is from, in my case, one point of view. And it seems like everyone is it's the same for everybody else. I only ever look out of one set of eyes. Everything is only my experience and the rest is kind of stories. Uh, like I've never been to Antarctica, so for me, I have no experience of it. So for me, it's, an, it's, it's a story. I'm not saying it does exist or it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I have no experience of it. And um, in terms of the mystery, uh, it's I think going to sleep is a good example of it. You know, and it, it sort of feels like layers going down through different layers. You know, I'll sort of close my eyes and I'll be going, I'll be thinking and then my thinking becomes more extreme as it's kind of I go into a sort of dreaming layer. Then I go uh, through that. And as I do that, it gets more impersonal and I can have dreams that are very strange and frightening and that, you know, I'm sort of going through the psychic layer. And then at some point I drop at the bottom of that into deep dreamless sleep where I, where there's nothing, you know, I have no thoughts, no personality, no heartaches, no joys, no nothing, no me, no body. I've got no experience, which, you know, that's you could that, that could be a description for death, really. And yet I never, you know, I, I don't mind going to sleep. I don't mind that at all. And when I wake up, I feel refreshed. So wherever I go in that deep dream of sleep, I, it's a good place because I feel refreshed. And if I can't get to it, I'm, I'm I get very distressed, you know, like if you've ever like talking about animation, um, you know, I can remember doing a couple of uh, like all nighters, you know, two days in a row. So that's like 48 hours of not going to sleep. And it's it's very unpleasant <laughs> to stay up for that length of time, you know. So if I can't get to this place, <clears throat> which I just call it the mystery because it is a kind of a mystery. I go to it in meditation, like I go through exactly the same process in meditation as I do in as I go to deep dream to sleep, the only thing, the only difference is I'm conscious when I meditate. So I, I go down and where I'm heading or where I go to is, is what I call the mystery. It's below everything and it's this kind of source of everything, you know. So is there a connection between mystery and illusion of reality or no? 
Yeah, well, the 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 more you pull back from existence, the more real things get. And the most real thing for me is the the mystery. And in terms of the illusion of reality, like, for example, you've never seen your own face. You know, that's a good that's a good place to start. You've never seen the back of your head. So you kind of assume it's there. But if you you know, I mean, we're looking at screens now and it really looks like I've got a face. You know, I really I really it's very it's very convincing, you know, or if I look in a mirror, I um, go, yeah, well, there's a reflection of my face, but I've never seen my face the way I see anybody else's face. You know, now you could get into, well, that's just to do with your eyeballs. And, you know, maybe if you squint your eyeballs, you can see the tip of your nose or whatever. But there's loads of different things that like that. Once you stop assuming, you can begin to kind of see, yeah, this is all a sort of like a screen. This is it has the appearance of reality and depth, but it's actually um, possibly not. And as you pull back from that, like as soon as you close your eyes, you're starting to pull back from it. As you pull back from your senses, um, you get you go backwards into the mystery. Do you think reality is is everything that's in our heads or there is more to it? We see what we see. We see trees, you know, we see uh, people and so on. Do you think it's all of it or there is more that we don't see? You know, as I say, when you pull back from it, there's the further back you pull, the more real things are. So there's a whole like psychic world there as well that's more real and more apparent. And some people are more sensitive to, to that than others. And they will kind of see it coming through the screen uh, of existence. Um, and, you know, you get all the different kind of psychic phenomenon that people talk about. Uh, but again, it's not, I, you know, encourage people not to get distracted by that and to keep going back, keep going back on, into the mystery, you know, because the psychic world is a kind of a, dangerous kind of place to mess around with um so uh, the idea of like what what uh, reality very strongly tries to encourage you to feel like is that you're that it's real and it's very believable and you know you're one person among many on a little planet you know mm-hmm. but that's not what my experience is you know my experience is uh, that like it's only ever from my perspective and it's only um, what is uh, in front of me and it has this three-dimensional quality and it feels like it's vast and this universe but if I just go with my direct experience it's actually quite small you know it's like arm's length it's like you were talking about trees like there's one of the things I talk about in the gentle snap about the other side of things. Like you can never see the other side of things. You know, if you're standing in front of a tree you, and you're looking at it, you can see this side of the tree. And you could say, OK, I, if I wanted to see the other side of the tree, I could just go around the tree and I'd, then I'd see the other side of it. But if you actually do that in your direct experience, you go around to the other side of the tree and now you're looking at you're only still seeing one side. You never see the other side of things, you know? And it just kind of highlights how, and it's really freaky if you do that and you very slowly start to walk around the tree, you can see, you know, you can see part of it disappearing and another part of it appearing. And it has this, you know, you can see the illusion being created in front of you of kind of going, yeah, it really, my mind keeps thinking because I, I can remember what the other side looks like and my mind keeps going it's there it's definitely there but if you just go with your direct experience it's like no it keeps disappearing as i move around you know so these are just different things you can do to show demonstrate to yourself that there's a lot like a lot of what we just assume, take for reality is actually a lot of assumptions you know mm-hmm. yeah that's what i learned in love lo- in life um I try not to assume anything anymore. Because as soon as I start assuming, I'm I'm getting off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm that serious. Yeah, I know. Uh, but 
maybe it's for a reason that we don't uh, see everything because otherwise we will be overloaded with information. Yeah, well, it's like it, it, I was thinking of it as a bit like a bit a cinema. You know, life is a bit like a cinema, and you go to a sit, you go to the movie because you want to enjoy watching the movie. If you went with a really annoying friend who kept saying to you, you know, that's not real. That's just an illusion. It's just shadows on the wall. Um, why are you getting so upset? Or why are you laughing? Or why are you crying? That's none of this is real. It's just sound waves and light shadows on a wall, you know, and you'd be like, can you stop? I just want to enjoy the movie. You know? And so the illusion of reality is very believable because we want to, you know, we're, we're, we want to enjoy it. We want to we want to believe it's real, you know, there's a reason for that, you know. Well, if you don't believe it's real, then how can you exist? I and mean, then it just all the concepts go out of the window. Well, uh, I think you can, you can, it's, it, it's kind of like being in a cinema, like you don't believe the, the, the movie is real. But still, you'll cry and still you'll laugh. You know, there's something happening. There's a communication happening, and you're getting what you went to the movie for. You're having the experience that you wanted, even though you know it's real. It's kind of like that. Yeah, you can but still your know that. but your emotions are very real to you. So people experience different things in life through emotions, and so they are very real. So what does it mean? They're real in unreal reality. Uh, well, the only things I've seen that are real, that, that is real in existence is um, communication and love are the only two things. And uh, it's, it sort of reminds me of the old days, the olden days of the internet when we used to have chat rooms, you know. Um, you can have conversations with people and you can and things can be conveyed that are that are profound and are, are very real and it's almost like we kind of meet here to communicate you know in this in the same way we used to meet in chat rooms to communicate it's like we meet here you know these different people you know because one of the things about the illusion is that we feel like we're sharing the same experience whereas we know we've not we've not nothing we've no proof of that directly mm -hmm. you know like um even in terms of something really simple like um you know if i was standing beside you and i said you see that blue car down there and you said oh yeah i see that blue car the assumption there is that you're having the same experience as me and that what i am calling blue and how i experience the color blue you experience the exact same thing and that's an assumption. I don't know that because I don't look out of your eyes. All I know for definite is that we agree on the name. That's all I know. You know? Um, so that's what I mean about communication. It's like where it's almost like a universal kind of translator and that that kind of zooms out to, you know, I could talk to you and you could tell me that the world is a terrible place and everybody's out to get you and there's no magic and it's all science and it's a hard world. And that might not be my experience at all. And the feeling is there like that, oh, well, I have to convince you of what a lovely place the world is, you know, and it's like, well, because because I'm assuming that we're having the same we're sharing the same mm -hmm. experience instead of you're in your little bubble of existence and you're communicating what it's like to me, which is a very different way of, of seeing it, you know. Mm -hmm. Have you done psychedelics? No, I haven't. I don't have a drug kind of body, you know. I found that people have they have a predisposition towards drugs um, or alcohol or whatever. And uh, no, I did it. I did. Uh, I think I had a half an acid tab many, many years ago. It did not agree with me at all. I had a terrible time, and um, I think I tried two joints or something like that had no effect on me at all and i just wasn't interested you know even though i was around people who were really into it um mm -hmm. it just didn't it didn't um it didn't really it just didn't didn't do anything for me i, I didn't go down that um road but 
I heard somebody describe it because you can have profound insights because you can with different um, plant medicine or whatever way you want to describe it, different things, you can have profound insights, but it's very hard to integrate them, you know, it's mm. like you get a little window, a little window opens up and uh, you can see things and uh, it can be very hard then to go back to your life, you know. I had somebody described it to me. I thought it was a great description. It was, what did they say? It was, it's like stealing jewels from the altar. And I thought that's, a, you know, that's what I've experienced with people like who have done that. Like, it seems like it's very difficult to get a glimpse into something that you can't get to naturally, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, because it opens up, um, you go super deep inside yourself. That's mm. what that is. So what do you say to an artist who loses hope? He loses hope? Mm -hmm. In humanity or in themselves or, you know? I think what, in, what the in themselves, maybe in the world around them, but mostly in themselves? Well, you know, creating art is really one of the most hopeful things you can do because it's the most, um, you know, on the surface, it's the least practical, you know? And mm -hmm. like you were talking about a common thing that artists have, they're like, oh, well, in the face of all these terrible things that are happening in the world, and I'm just sitting in my studio drawing pictures, you know, shouldn't I be mm -hmm. helping people out of the Mediterranean or, you know, feeding people or whatever, you know? So to make art, you have to somewhere, I think, get the value of it and you know, it's like that famous quote from um, Winston Churchill when they when, he, when they were running out of money in the war, and uh, they said, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna we could save money by shutting down the art programs in the schools." And his response was something along the lines of, "If we if we stop making art, then what's the point? What are we fighting for?" Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. it's like he got that it was that valuable, you know. And um, so, like. I think if you recognize that of all the things that you could be drawn to, to be drawn to to make art, it, it's it's an indication of a sensitivity to value is not apparent. You know, it's not like building bridges or a stock market or any of that kind of thing. You know, it's very ephemeral. The creation of art and yet everybody kind of gets it not not everybody like has an appreciation of you know art um as you you know everyone's had the you know particularly artists you know you've had people come to visit your house and you've got your paintings all over the place and they don't comment on them but they don't even make any reference to them you know you've had those kind of people but, but even when there isn't when there's no art at all you can it, it the world is a lot grayer you know um so I think as well that the creation of art is a, is a it's a sort of an expression of our little sense of our part in the creation of existence, you know, and it's like that roomy quote of, you know, you're not a drop in the ocean, you're the whole ocean contained in a drop, you know, that uh, there's a sort of little spark of divinity in everybody and part of that expression is creation you know we want to create we want to get the inside of us on the outside we want to in some way do that and depending on what the inside of you feels like will reflect in the what you create and how you feel about it you know and as we we're all in the kind of process of becoming more conscious whether we're conscious of that, of that or not it seems like that's what's happening and that's never an easy thing to become more conscious because you, you know when you're uh, as you're becoming more conscious of something that process the edge of con unconsciousness into consciousness it's always an uncomfortable time you know it's like you know if you 
suddenly become aware that you've been unconsciously manipulating somebody for a long time. It's really, it really doesn't make you feel good, you know? It's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So uh, your art is always an expression of that, of what's going on inside you, you know? Mm-hmm. So the f- feeling hopeless is just another expression of that, you know? It's mm-hmm. part of the process of you becoming more conscious and um, sometimes you can feel like you're crossing the desert and that you you can be crossing the desert for years where everything just seems hopeless but um, there's a thing in Taoism uh, it's something along the lines of the blind students follow the blind teacher listening to the wisdom of the canes tapping you know and it's kind of like that it's like you can be going across the desert going this is hopeless it's terrible uh, ignoring the fact that you're still walking you know you're still walking this the wisdom of your feet moving forward even though you've no reason to move forward even though it seems like all hope is gone and you can be walking along going oh, all hope is gone i'm just i'm on the floor here and just it's terrible and yet your feet keep moving you know and eventually you get to the other side of the desert and Oh, you die. Oh, you die. Oh, you die. Yeah. yeah. But you'll you still die moving. <laughs> uh, yeah. The reason I must um, I, I ask this question because I I talked to one of the artists and I couldn't make him change his mind. You know, it just he said nope. I wouldn't do it again. And I, I think he lost hope. And I wouldn't I do what again? Well, like doing art. Like, I, I think he got so disappointed in himself that he couldn't do it again. And it, I'm just thinking that it's going to take time, but he would come back to it. Yeah, but I, I mean, that could apply to anything, you know, like... People, like that feeling of losing hope or trying, you know, and failing, it's mm-hmm. uh, it can be very crushing, you know, if you're really in, if you're really invested in it, you know, it's like people who do very well financially and then they lose all their money and they just they're like they mm-hmm. feel like uh, they don't exist anymore because they were defining themselves by their money, you know, they didn't actually know who they were, you know. Similarly, like if you define yourself by your artistic success your financial success, your marital success, your health, you know, all sorts of, you know, people uh, do it for all sorts of reasons. And part of it is, um, you know, this kind of dark night of the soul that, you know, you go through where you get the chance to see that you are something other than the thing that you were defining yourself by. Or, as you say, you die. Yeah, or you die. That that's die. simple. <laughs> Why do you think people feel lonely? Do you ever feel lonely? Um, a lot less. Um, usually it's to do with looking outside yourself for something that's actually inside yourself. And uh, so the kind of cliche would be you've made somebody, you fall in love. You you experience love that you never experienced before, and you feel so connected to this other person. And then they either die or they leave you, and you're bereft. And you're like, oh my god, I'm never going to feel those feelings again. Completely overlooking the fact that when the person was with you and they were right beside you, you didn't ever feel those feelings in that person's body or inside their system. The only place you felt it was inside you which logically would lead you to kind of go, well, they're inside me and this person's actually just a trigger. You know, when I'm with this person, I feel these lovely feelings. So um, when they go, then I kind of think, oh, I have no access to those feelings, but they're all inside you. So um, if you make it, then your focus to find how to feel those feelings, whether there's another person to trigger them or not, is a beautiful thing to do and it's the kind of end of loneliness because the feeling of loneliness is i i need somebody outside me to make me feel a certain way and for as long as you do that then you're at the mercy of other people 
and you're not really like say in a relationship you're not really able to love them freely because i kind of want something from them i you know you have to love me back in a certain way so that i get to feel a certain way whereas when you can focus on um finding those feelings inside yourself um whether there's somebody there or not um then that's the end of loneliness that's been my experience anyway I, I find that there are many layers of loneliness. It's not just about um, experiencing loneliness with or without the spouse. It's it's a lot more than that. Yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, it comes down to this thing of what I was saying about you only ever look out of one set of eyes. So there is a deep thing in all of us, and certainly yeah, in all of us, that th this kind of knowledge that um, there's just you, there isn't anybody else, because you never experience like anybody else the same way as you experience yourself. And I think somewhere we know that and we don't like it. And it's hard to face into it. It's hard to face into this thing of like, it's just me. It's just me on the inside here. I'm, it's always going to be just me inside here, you know. Um, but I think, you know, there's a kind of school of thought that says God is a single uh, lonely entity that's made up all these people just to try and not feel so lonely. And there's a sort of grain of truth in that, you know, in one way. Um, but then like everything, this, you know, it's multi, you know, this mm -hmm. dimensional. Do you have any advice how to overcome the feeling of rejection coming from the closest people? Uh, well, it's similar to what I was saying. Uh, the less you need from other people, because the feeling of rejection comes from, you know, I want something from the other person, like acceptance or mm -hmm. inclusion or all those kind of things. And if I don't have that, if that or oh, love. Know, yeah, or love. Um, if I don't get that, then uh, I'm cut off from it. Whereas when you can find it inside yourself, then what other people do um, doesn't hurt in the same way. Uh, because you need less and less and less from them. And you're with somebody because you enjoy them. And that's all. There's no other... Um, I don't need anything from them. So it's very it's very hard to be rejected by somebody. I mean, somebody might reject you. They might go, that's it, I'm leaving or whatever. Mm -hmm. They still might take those actions, but it won't um, hurt in the same way because the meaning is different. You know, often these the, it's the meaning that we assign to people's actions, you know. And it comes down to what I was saying earlier on about the parenting thing, you know. Like often when we get into relationships with people, we have this long shopping list of here's all the things I couldn't sort out with my parents. And, you know, now you've got to sort them out. <laughs> you've got to parent me. And uh, when they don't, and of course they don't because, you know, we're all human. Um, then we get deeply hurt, you know, because it's an old hurt. It's the hurt of a wounded kind of childhood hurt, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and if that happens to be rejection, then it's going to hurt um a lot, but this thing I'm saying about finding uh, the source of love, which is inside, um, and that every that all the feelings of love, whether you know, like if you're if you're with somebody and you feel like you're completely accepted by that person, that you only ever have that feeling inside you, so it's there already. It's just a matter of being able to access it. So if you can access that when there's nobody around and you can feel completely accepted, then what? somebody the actions that somebody external to you takes it's not going to affect that because you've already accessed it yourself you know like i don't need that other person to make me feel accepted it's, mm -hmm. I, I can access it already you know beautiful it is yeah i'm gonna cry and not drink <laughs> Russian people are deeply spiritual people, I think. 
it's my experience and my sense of them you know they get it you know they just get it and look like irish people are similar you know they're just naturally very deep spiritual you know magical kind of people and i think russian people are very similar you know people are also interested in in things that are on the inside as opposed to mm. outside yeah mm. Would you like to add anything else before we quit? Um, I think just uh, kindness. I think kindness is a highly undervalued thing and I would encourage everyone to be kind. That's all. I have an argument for that. Oh yeah, go ahead. That's, that's here. Not everyone needs that. Like you can be kind to people and they will punish you for that. Yeah, well, I'd be kind anyway. I don't do it for other people. Yeah, I know you do it for yourself, but that's what I thought in the, <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> What that it, oh well like the idea of karma you know that if you do good things good things will happen to you it is kind of true but if you it's only true if you don't it's a weird kind of thing i found that you have to do it not expecting anything in return like if you go well i'll be kind to people and they'll be kind back then they won't be kind back but if you go i'm just going to be kind because it makes me feel good i feel mm -hmm. like when i'm kind and when i'm unkind you know if i if i you know evaluate what the different, you know, how I, how do I feel when I'm being unkind and how do I feel when I'm being kind? Me, I feel much better when I'm being kind. You know, I just don't enjoy being unkind. So I do it for that reason, um, which is, I suppose, is kind of selfish reason. But I think like, I think facing the fact that most of the things we do is selfish anyway, um, meaning we do things because of how it makes us feel. Um, I think if you're honest about that with yourself, then you can just get on with doing the sort of things that make you feel good. But the idea of kindness um, and being kind to people, uh, it's such a small little change that uh, if it was, um, if more people were kind, I think everything would be a lot easier, you know? Like in my experience, yeah, you get the odd person who doesn't get it, uh, but generally it, seems to just make everything in life a lot softer and life's hard enough as it is yeah but do you think some people are wired to be kind or kinder as opposed to other people who just lack that quality i think it's come it's down to consciousness really i think the more conscious you become the easier it is to be kind or you just naturally default to it mm -hmm. and that's been my experience and, uh, you know, I'm certainly like everybody, you know, I, the, the longer I've lived, the more co conscious I am. And so I'm kinder now, I'm more conscious now, so I'm kinder now than I was last year. And I'm way kinder than I was 10 years ago, you know. That's nice to hear. <laughs> so how can people uh, find you? Um, well, for if you like the art stuff, that's johndalton.me, not .com, .me. And if you like the um, spiritual stuff, furtheremergence.com, all one word. All right. I'd like to thank you, John, for your time and inspiration and words of wisdom. And I hope more artists find hope and don't give up. So thank you. It's lovely. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much for having me on. And thanks for doing your uh, work and your podcast and for not giving up as well. Um, it's great. It's a real service that you're doing. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Good to see. I hope to see you sometime in the future as well. <laughs> Please take a second of your time to rate the podcast if you feel so inclined. Thank you very much.